Thank you for giving me the, the opportunity uh, to talk about the relationship that I have perceived between allergy and both the acute COVID infection and its long-term consequences. And I've labeled the talk, the good, the bad, or the ugly, um, after the iconic um, spaghetti Western. And my focus will be on eosinophils as maybe sometimes good and sometimes bad. But of course, the ugly and the bad is the virus itself. But there are other ugly facts which has been highlighted by the media rather than the medical and scientific community is uh, that children hit by long COVID too, and that's despite claims they're more likely to be hit by a bus. Uh, it is an embarrassment to me and many of my colleagues that it has taken the media to highlight that this is a problem that requires attention. So why am I suddenly focused on this as a pediatric allergist? Well, I've been seeing patients whose allergic problems have worsened considerably since they've had COVID infection. And the other very interesting point is that the mechanisms by which viruses such as COVID are eliminated by the immune system includes allergic patterns of response. If we look at the published data um, now and working with Daniel Mumblett, who's done a huge study which has just been published on pediatric COVID, it is suggested that, child that children with asthma or allergies were more likely to develop long COVID. So here's a history from one of my clinics. This is a young lady who had hay fever during the tree pollen season and was tree pollen allergic and knew about this and had had it for many years. And one of the problems that she had, which is directly associated with that, is an itchy mouth and tongue when eating apples, only when they're fresh, but not when they're cooked. This is known as pollen food syndrome, and it is a mild, non-life-threatening allergy. It's a nuisance and unpleasant, but nothing more. In November 2020, she had COVID infection and she only had one day of fever and a temporary loss of a few days of no taste. In the spring of 2021, her hay fever was very much worse, but the most startling thing was in June 2021, she started to eat an apple and had a full-blown anaphylactic reaction. That is a life-threatening reaction to eating an apple, having previously had very mild problems. So the question is, why was the COVID infection mild? And yet subsequently, the apple allergy evolved into a life-threatening problem. Well, one possible explanation is that the molecule that the virus attaches to, to get into our cells, is known as ACE2, angiotensin converting en enzyme 2. And in People who have allergic asthma, particularly if there's a lot of allergy, the levels of this molecule in the lining cells in the nose of children is very much lower. In other words, the molecule that allows the virus access to begin to infect us is reduced in children who have allergy and asthma. And even more startling is if, and this is from an adult study, looking at the lining cells in the lung before and after being exposed to the allergen to which they're allergic. And the levels of this molecule go down if they've had an acute exposure to the substance to which they're allergic, and therefore they're less susceptible to the infection. But what about the immune response and the way in which uh, this, um, orchestrates the elimination of the virus. While well, the virus attaches to the ACE2 and gets into the cells, it then uses the cell's metabolism to replicate itself. But of course, it damages the cell at the same time. The cell's not totally static. It releases alarm signals. There are a whole series of what are known as peptide regulatory factors, which are released by the cell saying, help, I'm being attacked. And this particularly activates a group of what are known as innate lymphocytic cells, 
which then release molecules which activate specifically eosinophils, which are allergy associated cells. And this happens within a day or two of the start of the infection. And those eosinophils have the capacity to attack the virus directly and eliminate it. And the eosinophils also release some proteins, which then cause the virus infected cells to be shed. Um, and then holding in the virus within them, they can then be eliminated. So that happens within a very short period of time of the start of the infection, the innate and rapid response. And this is just an illustration, and this is very startling. This is patients that have been admitted to intensive care with catastrophically severe COVID infection. On day naught, when they're admitted, the levels of eosinophils in their blood is virtually zero. And then by day three to seven, in those patients who are beginning to recover, the eosinophils are starting to rise. And by the time they get to one to two weeks, the eosinophils are back up to normal or even a little bit above normal, whereas those that have died have failed to activate this response. And uh, maybe because of the absence of the eosinophils early on, they don't begin to get rid of the virus and therefore have uh, an, an increasingly severe problem. But then we need to look at what happens from day eight to 14 onwards. What happens with the what's known as adaptive immune response? Well, the virus will also be picked up by what are known as antigen presenting cells and the most important ones are known as dendritic cells, which pick up the virus and then the cell moves through the lymphatic system to what are known as regional lymphoid accumulations to lymph nodes. And there the cell talks to the or orchestrator of the immune response, uh, thymus dependent or T lymphocytes. And those lymphocytes have the capacity to recruit a whole orchestra of virus killing cells, not just eosinophils, but neutrophils, natural killer cells. And at the same time, they activate B cells to produce antibodies but that's going to take two weeks or more for those to appear. And the combined attack then is antibodies and all these cells going at the virus and the virus infected cells and getting rid of the infection. So as you will see, an allergic pattern of immune response is really important early on and contributes to the elimination of this infection and recovery. So that's the good side of having an allergy biased immune response. And I'm hypothesizing that those who are allergic, who have already an increased allergic response, are more equipped to be able to orchestrate this response and therefore get rid of the virus. But is there a downside? This is a, a, an eosinophil in the circulation that's releasing rather nasty toxic proteins. And these can do a lot of damage. And interestingly, they can also cause blood clots. So if the eosinophil is not controlled after the infection is cleared, then they're going to release these toxic proteins into the circulation and can damage tissues throughout the body. And if you look at long COVID problems and what are known as hyper eosinophilic syndromes, these are people who for various reasons have an excess of eosinophils, they're almost identical problems. So hyper eosinophilic syndromes are associated with heart damage, cardiomyopathy, with clotting, thromboembolic disease, with lung problems, with neural prob neuro uh, uh, neuropathies, and with a lot of skin lesions. So what's long COVID? Myocardial injury, thromboembolic consequences, pulmonary disease, neural dysfunction, and skin rashes. Very similar. Do we have any evidence? Well, the only evidence I can find at the moment is um, long COVID skin problems. And there's, there's something called pernio where they have chilblain-like lesions. And a lot of them also have recurrent urticaria or hives rashes. And skin biopsies have shown that there are lots of eosinophils in the skin in the little blood vessels, sometimes causing obstruction to very small blood vessels. So there's evidence there, but what we now need is to look very much more carefully at all uh, people, in particular children with long COVID to see whether eosinophils are behaving inappropriately. And there are various tests that can be done for that. And I'll take you back to my clinic again, 
and talk here about another patient who was totally asymptomatic. This is a girl of 12, of 10, sorry, who had a positive RT-PCR, the swab, because a, num a member of the family had active infection. So, but this girl had no symptoms at all. She had previous eczema, asthma, and hay fever. And then between recovery from this infection and now, she's had worsening of her asthma and hay fever, nausea, pain, fatigue, brain fog, and most alarming of all, ticks and what's known as coprolalia, offering uh, uttering of obscene words um, in a very sort of uh, inappropriate and compulsive way. This is that particular problem is very similar to a condition that is as, uh, associated with previous streptococcal infection and is thought to be an autoimmune response. And actually autoimmune diseases and allergic diseases occur much more frequently together by, than by chance. And so there is a strong relationship immunologically. So what I'm suggesting is that there is something about allergy and particularly eosinophils that needs to be focused on in research now. In the acute infection, there is increased morbidity and mortality associated with not having a good enough eosinophilic response. Recovery is associated with the eosinophils being activated, but there is a potential downside that that activation and maybe other components of the allergic immune response then increase the risk of long COVID. So research is urg urgently required to investigate this association um, this is at the moment a hypothesis, and a hypothesis demands research uh, to establish whether this is the case, because if it is, there are potential treatments focused on the eosinophil and the allergic immune response, which might benefit those with long COVID. So thank you very much. Again, we focus on the bad and the ugly, which is the COVID infection, but allergy may be both good and ugly in some way uh, and let us now get on with the research and try and sort it all out thank you very much